you have your copy of God's Word this morning, I'm going to invite you to take it, and let's turn together to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, and this morning we're going to be looking at verses 17 through 21, finishing out the end of chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, again, verses 17 to the end of the chapter, and if you found your way there, I'm going to invite you for, to stand for the reading of God's Word. Again, Paul writing, and he says, Brethren, join in following my example, and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk, of whom I often told you, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory by the exertion of the power that He has even to subject all things to Himself. You can be seated. Paul has been encouraging the believers here at Philippi really in the aspect of the Christian life. And, and how we are to live, and the things that we are to adhere to, and the things that we are not to adhere to, the things that we should, uh, should take joy and pride in, the things that we should cast aside. And understanding that all of this is really culminating that process of sanctification. What does that process of sanctification look like in the life of the believer? What are we fighting for? What are we longing for? And Paul had addressed that last week in verse 12, when he talks about it, he says, I've not already obtained it or become perfect. He says, but I am pressing forward. I'm forgetting what lies behind and reaching toward and pressing on towards the goal of the upward call in Christ Jesus. So Paul has been talking about this life of sanctification, what it looks like to be continually conformed more and more into the image of Jesus. Now, Paul also realized that as he encouraged the Philippians to do this, that they needed a couple of things. They needed to understand how they should live their lives, and they needed to be able to look towards others to see that, but he also wanted to caution them against those who might come in and try to deceive them. And so this morning in this text, Paul there in the very opening parts of verse 17 tells us how we should live. And I want you to notice there, he says, brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern that you have in us. I love the fact that over and over we see Paul use this word brethren. Paul's heart and love for the church is on, always on full display. Paul didn't see himself as greater or more important than anyone else in the church of Christ, even though he had been entrusted with a great responsibility and calling. Each member of the church was his family in Christ, and he loved and cared about them as he would his own flesh and blood. He uses this phrase, brethren, over and over to call them back to this reminder that they're part of a unified family. And the same should be exhibited in our own Christian walk. Paul's love and care in writing this letter was because he saw them as family, and he wanted to encourage them in the things that they should do and caution them in the things that they shouldn't do. He wanted to challenge them to have the right relationships and to discourage them from having the wrong relationships. I want you to take a look around you this morning. Look to your left, to your right, in front of you and behind you. Those people who are gathered in this room this morning are your family. We're not just a social club of people who could get together on certain occasions and tolerate one another. If you've ever been a member of an outside social club, whether it be, you know, uh, you can point to the Lions Club or the Elks Club or some other kind of uh, civic organization, you know, not everybody is in those groups like each other. They just get together because they're part of the same group and they just tolerate one another. I hope and pray this morning that that is not the case here at Barberville Baptist Church because we are a family. We've been adopted in by our Heavenly Father, and it's not an exaggeration to say this morning that we should love each other as we love our own flesh and blood. We should care for and support one another as we do our own blood relatives. And also, brothers and sisters, we should exhibit the same patience and grace with one another. Because the Christian life is not meant to be lived in isolation, but is meant to be lived in community. And that care is exhibited here as Paul opens that verse with the word brethren. He's calling them to remember that as he says things, as he says things that are encouraging, but also says as he says things that are challenging, he wants them to understand his love for them. But notice what Paul goes on to say there. As he's talking about how we should live, he really gives a motivation, something that we can look to. He says, join in following my example. 
Now, it might seem from an initial reading that Paul is being awfully proud or arrogant in this command, right? Because he's been talking to them about laying hold of the prize, of what it means to live a life that is committed wholly to Christ and shunning everything else in this world. And so Paul gets to verse 17, and he says, if you want to see how you should live, just copy me, follow my example. It seems rather arrogant, but what we understand is that Paul had lived a life that is easily testified throughout the Scriptures, a life of faithful obedience to and imitation of Christ. And because he had done that, he could easily invite the Philippians to imitate him. One commentator said that like a teacher who writes the copy upon the blackboard, Paul points to the pattern of his own life. In other words, what Paul is saying is, he says, you copy down what I have written with my life and then do it. Now, Paul was not afraid in calling the believers to follow after him. Paul was not being arrogant or proud in doing this because Paul understood the responsibility that he had been entrusted with and the accountability of such a call. Paul knew that as a teacher, as one who had been called by God, that there was a certain responsibility that he was to live a life just as any other believer was, but for the scripture says that for teachers, it's even higher. So Paul knew that and understood that. So his life and this commitment was because he understood that responsibility. And he knew that the last day he was going to stand before God and give an account for what he had done. So if Paul called the Philippian church to follow his example and he lived an an unrighteous life, he knew he was going to give an account for that. And that always was at the forefront of Paul's mind so that he lived his life as well as a human being can, as well as a sinful creature can, Paul lived his life in faithful obedience to Christ. He would write to the church at Thessalonica and say, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example because we did not act in an undisciplined manner among you. Not because we do not have a right to this, but in in order to offer ourselves as a model for you so that you would follow our example. We need to understand that as one teacher said, we have no choice between being an example and not being one. We can only choose between being a good example and being a bad example. We're always going to be an example to someone. And so Paul says, I want you to look at my life. As I seek to emulate Christ, I want you to emulate me. Because that's often the pushback that people say. It's like, well, wouldn't it be better for Paul to have said, well, follow after Christ? And, and he does say that in other places. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, be imitators of me, just as I am also of Christ. But what the Philippian church already understood, because they knew Paul so well, is this is really what he's saying in this verse. When he says, joining and following my example, he's basically helping them to understand, I'm following Christ. And his life was such a testimony of faithful obedience to Christ that the Philippian church would have had no trouble correlating the two of those things. When they thought about following Paul, they would have said, well, we're going to follow Paul because he's following Jesus. We see the example of his life. So Paul was not being arrogant or proud. He's calling them, in a sense, to follow him as he follows after the example of Jesus. But Paul goes on and doesn't just talk about himself, but he also talks about others in that same Christian community of faith. He says, and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. What is that pattern? That pattern is that process of sanctification. We know that when we are saved, we are justified. God has saved us. He has given us uh, Christ's righteousness. And now we are no longer dead in our trespasses and sins, but he's made us new in Christ. That happens instantly upon the moment of conversion. But the second part of our salvation It is that sanctification process that carries on throughout the entirety of our life. From the moment of our conversion to the moment we breathe our last breath, Christ is shaping us, molding us into the person that he wants us to be, more conformed to his uh, his commands for us. So Paul points to himself, but then he also points, he says, observe those who walk according to that pattern. Earlier in this letter, he had pointed to both Timothy and Epaphroditus and pointed out how they had been obedient to the call of God and how they had been faithful in their Christian life. And so no doubt he points back to them at this moment, but he also points to others who are there in the church as well. Paul would say in Hebrews chapter 13, remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you and considering the results of their conduct, imitate their faith. This is what we are called to do as Christians. And really, this points to the importance of godly relationships in the life of the believer. As Christians, those who we cultivate the closest relationships with should be other believers in Christ. 
I'm going to say that again. Those who we cultivate the closest relationships with should be other believers in Jesus Christ. Why? Because whether we admit it or not, our friendships shape who we are, not just in our actions, but also in our thoughts and the way that we look at the world. And this is the reason why the Bible says that two people, a husband and wife, should not be unequally yoked. It's the reason that the scripture says that if you have a non-believer and a believer, they should not get married because it will always just cause problems from the very beginning. Now, many of you are old enough to probably have heard somebody say, you know, uh, either a guy or a girl who wants to date someone, they say, well, you know, I'll, I'll lead them to Christ. Well, that is a bold ambition. Lead them to Christ, and then we'll talk about whether you can have a relationship with them or not. Because oftentimes what happens is it's not the person leads the other one to Christ, it's the one who is not a Christian pulls the other one further away from where they need to be in Christ. Now, this is not to say that as Christians that we don't have non-Christian friends. We should. It's part of what it means to live in this world. We should have those who we are friends with in our place of work or employment, our place of where we go to school, our neighbors. We should have people who we are casual friends with who are non-Christians so that we can order to exert the influence of the gospel and to share the good news of Christ with them. But those people with whom we have the closest, most intimate kinds of friendships should be those who share our beliefs and our faith because we want to have an influence on them, and most assuredly, they will have an influence on us. Paul says to look for those who walk according to the pattern, who walk according to the gospel, he says, and follow them, observe them, watch them, watch how they live their lives. I've shared with you many times, you know, one of my favorite uh, types of things to read outside of, of studying for, for sermons and studying theology is to read biographies. And I love to read biographies of faithful men and women, missionaries, pastors, church leaders, and why? Because you read their stories and we are encouraged by their example. We're encouraged by their faith, by their commitment to the gospel. So let me ask you a question this morning. What examples are you following in your own life? It can be very easy for us to look at the wrong type of examples and let our pattern of life be led in a direction very opposite of what Paul is calling us here and of what God intends for us. You know, we live in a time where people's lives and behavior are far more open and exposed than at perhaps any other time in human history. You go back 150 years ago, you did not know what the guy across town was doing at every single moment of every single day. Only if the guy did something important, like get married, rob a bank, buy a new horse, well, you might know or hear about something that had happened in his life. But now, because we have social media, whether it be Facebook or Instagram or YouTube or TikTok, we know every single thing about people at every single moment of the day, sometimes far more than we'd ever want to or desire to know. And this all exists for a people to display the way that the things that they love and pursue and how they live their lives. You know, there's a term that they use for people who become really, really popular on social media, and the term that they use is influencer. And they use that term influencer because they understand that because so many people are watching these social media people and watching the things that are happening, that these people carry weight and influence. They can convince people to buy certain products or to go to certain places or to eat certain types of food. And so we can easily get caught in the trap of seeing the lives of these people and be tempted to be desired to be like them or to do the things that they can do. But friends, let us not look to the latest and greatest social media influencers or celebrities for how we should live our lives. Even as Christians, we can easily fall into this trap. We look around at our lives, we look around at the things that are going on, and we can be discouraged because maybe things aren't great at work. We get discouraged because maybe things aren't great in our family. And we look online and we see this person who seems to have the perfect job and all the money in the world, has a perfect relationship, has the perfect kids, and we come in to say, oh man, if I could just be like them. Let me share a little secret with you. As someone who has been around uh, certain things with social media and certain things with television, none of that stuff is real. There's a reason they call it reality TV. It's like, it's, it's all fake. I hope I didn't burst somebody's bubble this morning. But brothers and sisters, when you go through seasons like that where your job isn't the greatest or your family life is hard and you're struggling maybe with your spouse or with your kids, don't, don't look to the person on the internet to find that influence and help. Look around this room because there's people in this room who have gone through those same things. 
They've gone through having a job that was difficult and, and endured through it, and God guided them. There are couples in this room who have had struggles in their marriage and who have gone through the same season of life that you have, and they can help you. There's parents in this room who have struggled with their kids, and they can give you the help that you need. That's what Paul is saying. He says, when you need help, he says, as you're walking through this process of sanctification and you come to a place where you're struggling, he says, look to those people who are your brothers and sisters in Christ and allow them to influence your life. Allow them to help you and to guide you in your faith. But I want you to notice here that Paul now doesn't just talk about those who we should copy and those who we should seek to, to live like, but he also gives us those who we should avoid. Look at verses 18 and 19. He says, For many walk, of whom I have often told you, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. Paul now moves to a very clear and precise warning against those who should not be followed as an example. Paul says, follow those fellow believers in Christ, follow those who are after the same pattern of life as you are. He said, but also beware of those who would mislead you. Now, commentators agree that it was not that this had already totally crept into the church at Philippians because Paul doesn't personally address the church at Philippi and correct them on this. He just offers them this warning because he understood that at a certain point in time, it was going to happen. False teaching was going to try to infiltrate the church at Philippi, and he wanted them to be on the lookout, because the best time to prepare for false teaching is not when it arises, but before it arises. And having an understanding of theology and biblical truth will prepare a church to see those who would teach false doctrine before they have a chance to deceive others. There's an old saying that says, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Because false teaching oftentimes is not open and grotesque when it comes in, but it comes in very subtly and sneaking. Now, we've had an interesting visitor around our house the past few weeks. We have a skunk who's decided to take up residence somewhere in our side yard. Now, if you noticed a skunk creeping, creeping about your house and walking across the front porch as we did the other night, you don't open the door and let it in right? You know that even though it's a small creature and they're somewhat cute, you know, they're cute animals, but you know it's, it's dangerous, right? Because it's, it's not vicious in the sense that it's maybe going to attack you, but if it gets inside of your house, it's really going to ruin your, your week and your month. So you don't let it in. But now if you have a cat or a dog in the house, you know that your family pet, especially at this time of the year, can walk into the house carrying one single flea on its back. And you can't see it. You don't know that it's there. And that flea gets inside the house, and before you know it, your entire house is infested with fleas. So brothers and sisters, false teaching is oftentimes a creeping thing. It doesn't come in very boldly and pronounce itself. It comes in much like that flea does, hiding on something else, riding alongside something else and coming inside of the church. This is one reason why in our middle school and high school class, we're going through a systematic theology book because I want our young people to be prepared for their own personal life to avoid false teaching and to know what it looks like, but then to be ready for years to come because in a few years, they're gonna grow up and they're gonna be inside this church helping to lead the things that are going on and we want them to be prepared. Paul says to be on the lookout, to be on guard for them. He says, for many walk of whom I have told you and now tell you that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. This is the sad thing, that Paul says that there are many of them. It's not just a few, but there are many of them. Satan is a master deceiver, and he's always been around to make a poor imitation of the gospel, to peddle to weak people and to peddle to people who have not been discipled well. The interesting thing about bad doctrine is that it never really changes. If you look at the history of the church, and from, from the time of Jesus until now, small details may change, but at the root, it's really just the same old false doctrine over and over, recrafted, repackaged, and represented to people. You know, a few weeks ago, we talked about, I talked about the show Antiques Roadshow. We talked about people finding something they thought was worthless and it becoming a valuable item, something that's a priceless example of a piece of work of art. And we talked about how that is when we as Christians, when we discover what Christ has done for us, that he has given us an item in our salvation, something of just innumerable value. 
But what happens far more on that show than the discovery of an unknown masterpiece is somebody who walks in and they think that they have something that's worth a million dollars and they end up finding out it's worth $10 because it's a fake. It's a copy. It's a poor imitation. And brothers and sisters, this is what false gospel is. On the outside, oftentimes it looks like the real thing. Sometimes it even sounds like the real thing. But after a while, it begins to, as the old saying goes, unravel like a cheap sweater. And Paul is warning us here. He's warning them, but he's also warning us that there are many people like this, that there are many people who are going to try to corrupt the gospel of Jesus Christ. Satan is going to do everything he can to keep the truth of the gospel from being proclaimed. We can look around in our culture today, we see the prosperity gospel, we see antinomianism, we see hyper-grace, and then not even counting the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons and all these other false cults. So we must be keenly aware of this. We cannot allow ourselves to become so settled in our faith that we lose the guard and the watch for the danger that can creep in. And we understand this because Paul not only says that there are many of them, He says, of whom I have often told you. We have to be continually on that guard. And Paul says, he says, I'm going to continually remind you of this fact. I'm going to tell it to you over and over and over again. Why did Paul say he's going to do this? And why does he do it? Because we're human beings. And we tend to move past things and forget the danger that we once so readily recognized. Paul says, I know you're human. And I warned you about false teaching six months ago. But things have happened since then. Things have been fairly good in the church and things have been exciting and you've forgotten the warning that I gave you. So now I'm gonna remind you again. He's told the same thing to the church at Galatia. He says, he's warning those, he says, envying drunkenness, carousing and the things like this of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul was not afraid to continually to remind them over and over. And brothers and sisters, as Christians, we must be continually reminded of the danger of false teaching. Sadly, I have a a, a man or a friend that I've had in the ministry, a guy that I know who over the past six months, I've noticed in some of the things that he has been saying and, and putting online that I am deeply concerned that he is veering off into some type of false teaching. And it's tragic to see. This is a guy who's very solid in his, or seemed to be very solid in his faith, knew a lot of doctrine, but now it seems that he has veered off the edge. We must be careful. We must be faithful. We must be continually watching. But there's a mindset of when we have it, if we're going to be watching for false teaching, we don't want to turn into those who are just pointing out false teaching all the time in, in, a, in a spirit of anger or in a spirit of arrogance. Right? We want to do it boldly because the Scripture tells us we should do it, and we must do it because the Scripture tells us to do it. There's, there tends to be uh, two extremes when it comes to false teaching and the pointing out of false teaching. You have those who really do it out of anger, and they become almost self-justified in themselves. That's, that's really all they want to do is point out false teaching. But then on the other side, you have those who just don't do it at all. Uh, they said, well, I don't want to be accused of judging. I don't want to be accused of just pointing the finger all the time, and so they never do it. So Paul says, here's the way we do it. We do it because we must do it. But notice what he says there in verse 18. He says, I, tell, I now tell you even weeping. Paul was brokenhearted over false teaching. He was brokenhearted that the truth was being so tarnished. He was brokenhearted that there were those who had already been misled into believing a false gospel. And he was also brokenhearted that there were those who would be misled as those people continued to teach what they were doing. I loved what Albert Barnes said in his commentary. He, he gave three things, and listen to what he says. He says, quote, if there is anything that should make us weep, it is that there are those in the church who are hypocrites who dishonor their profession. We should weep, one, because they're in danger of destroying their own souls, two, because they are destined to certain disappointment when they stand before God, and three, because they injure the cause of religion and give occasion to the enemies of the Lord to speak reproachfully. So when we see those who are being misled by false teaching, we should be brokenhearted. Paul learned this from Jesus. You remember what he says in in Luke chapter 19, that when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it. He was brokenhearted at their being deceived, brokenhearted at their hard-heartedness. And this for Paul was not just a sentiment. It wasn't something he was just saying say, for the church at Philippi to say, well, oh, well, look how, how tender Paul's heart is. No, this was a deep commitment to him. 
He would use this language over and over again. Second Corinthians chapter two, for out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not so that you would be made sorrowful, but that you might know the love which I have, especially for you. Paul is brokenhearted over those, and we must be as well. When we look out and see those who are deceived by cults and by false religions, just as we saw this morning with what's happening in Cambodia, our hearts should be broken that there are so many people around the world who have been misled into a false religion, misled into a false gospel. Paul here is, is most poignantly directing his attention towards those who proclaim the name of Christ, but yet lived a life that was in complete opposition to that. He's pointing out that these are not just talking about non-believers, and he's not just talking about those who are believing a, an outright different religion. Paul here is, is pointing to the fact that there are those inside of the Christian community who also outwardly say that they're Christian, but by the demonstration of their lives, they bear themselves to be something completely different. They've taken the good news and they've tarnished it. They've taken the freedom from the law and they've abused it. They've taken Christian liberty and carried it to a great extreme in abusing what we have in Christ. Most people believe that who Paul is talking about here is those who are living lives in really opposition to the law, saying that the law really is no good anymore. We don't really need it. We can live our lives however we want to live them in freedom. Jesus will forgive us because his mercy is great. We've been forgiven of all of our unrighteousness. So just live your life and do what you want to do. But Paul issues a warning to those. Look at what he says. He says that those people who are like that are enemies of Christ. He says, enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, the cross here is not just referring solely to the cross itself and to Christ's atoning death. Paul is using this word in reference to the entirety of the gospel message. He, he says it's, he's talking about Jesus' birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ruling, and his reigning. He says they are enemies of the entirety of the gospel. Now, it's interesting to think about this. Again, remember, you're not talking about people who are in a different religion. Not talking about people outside of the church. He's talking about those who would claim to be inside the church, but yet, in fact, they are complete enemies of the good news of the gospel of Christ. And as I said earlier, let us not think this, this was relegated to the first century. There are those today inside the Christian community who claim to be Christian, who present themselves as Christians, but yet are teaching and believing things which are completely contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are even some today, there is a, what I referred to earlier as a hyper-grace movement inside of the church, and that seems to be mostly affecting in the uh, charismatic community, where again, they teach that the law is the Old Testament, it has nothing to do with us anymore, and because Jesus has come and we're forgiven of our sins, we don't have to worry about repentance, we don't have to worry about uh, uh, trying to live a godly lifestyle, we can just live however we want to live and everything will be okay. There is beginning to be yet another rise of anti-lordship salvation that says, you know, Jesus can be your Savior, but he doesn't necessarily have to be your Lord. I believe Scripture teaches that Jesus is our Savior and our Lord, that we can't separate the two. If he has saved us, then we will be obedient and follow him as Lord. So Paul says that those who are enemies of the cross of Christ, notice what's going to happen to them. And, and, and this is really where Paul's sorrow comes from, because he tells us in verse 19, he says, whose end is destruction. There's no doubt in Paul's mind where the end of the line is for these individuals. It ends in destruction, not just in an earthly sense, but more importantly, in an eternal one as well. Paul uses a word here for destruction that really means the exact opposite of salvation, if you could see two polar opposites, he says, salvation is on this one side and destruction is on the other. And that is where these individuals are headed. They believe themselves to be saved, but in fact are headed to eternal destruction. I've often said to me, one of the most terrifying passages in the Bible is found in Matthew chapter seven, where Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles, and I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Jesus here is clearly saying that on the last day, at the day of judgment, there are going to be individuals who stand before him, 
you almost imagine the, uh, the the guy in the old pictures in the old days, you know, they'd stand there and they'd have their picture taken like this, you know, that real proud look. You can almost imagine them walking up and they're just standing there waiting because they know, they just know that the words that's going to come out of Jesus' mouth is, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the rest prepared for you by my Father. And they're just sitting there and they're waiting. And Jesus said, in fact, I'm going to look at them and say, depart from me, for I never knew you. And what terrifying thought. But Paul says that's where these individuals are headed. That their end is destruction. They think and they proclaim that they're doing all of these wonderful things for God, but in the end, destruction awaits them. You know, in his letter to the church at Galatia, Paul didn't mince words when it came to false teaching. Galatians chapter 1 says, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, I say now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, he is to be accursed. The word accursed is anathema. It really is the idea of being damned. I heard one preacher say that basically what Paul is saying is that it would be better for someone to instantly die and go to hell forever than to continue to teach a false gospel in this world. That's how serious the truth of the gospel is. And this is why Paul is warning the church. We can be so tempted in 21st century America because we've been told that we're not to judge, we're not to criticize. You know, we don't want to draw attention to ourselves. We don't want to have people dislike us. But brothers and sisters, the gospel is worth it. It is worth people hating us, criticizing us, calling us names to stand for the truth of God's word to stand against false teachers, to stand against those who would teach things contrary to the gospel of Christ. Listen to what Jesus said. Jesus says, it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to him through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and were thrown into the sea than that he would cause one of these little ones to stumble. Those are harsh and serious words from our Savior. Paul says that their end is destruction. The fire which had been prepared for the devil and his angels. But notice what Paul goes on to say. He says not only is their end is destruction, he gives really qualifiers of how they live their lives and how the church at Philippi can see these people, how they can look at what they're doing and understand who they are because he says whose God, notice small g there, whose God is their appetite. These individuals found satisfaction in their earthly lusts. They sought to satisfy no one from the, but themselves and their own pleasures. I want you to think about how much that looks like the world we live in today. People who are so given over to selfish pursuits and ambitions. John warned us in 1 John, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is of the world. And this is how so many people live their lives today, not concerned about anything else, but how they can satisfy themselves. The world tells people, you be you. You do what you want to do. Do what makes you happy. Follow your heart. Don't let anybody tell you you can't. Whatever you feel, whatever you want, you do that thing. It doesn't matter what anybody else says, you do what you want to do. And Paul says this is exactly what's happening with these false teachers. There are those inside, Paul says, even in the Christian community at the church, around the church of Philippi in this period of time, who were encouraging people to do this same type of thing, to just pursue their own selfish ambitions. Why? Well, if you deny that there is the Lordship of Christ, if you deny that there's an expectation of holiness and righteousness, if you deny that there is a purpose for which God has called us to live, then yeah, sure, live however you want to live. Do whatever you want to do. Do what makes you happy. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, right? What did Jesus say about that man in that parable? He said, you fool, today your soul is required of you. Paul goes on to say, not only are they satisfying their own appetite. Not only is that their God, he says, whose glory is in their shame. Now we saw how clearly our culture paralleled to that first one there, that their God is their appetite. But I want you to notice how even much more so we see this in our time today, whose glory is in their shame. Paul says that they were celebrating and glorifying in the things that they should have been ashamed of. 
Now, for a moment, we look outside the church and we see this, right? We see this so prevalent in our culture that people are celebrating and glorying in things that should cause them to cover their faces in in just complete shame. From abortion to the LGBTQ movement, our culture is overwhelmed with people glorifying in things that they should be ashamed of. If you aren't in the loop of abortion care ministries, you might not realize that the Contrary to what you're told on the news media, that the large majority of those women who do seek abortion do so in the name of convenience. We're often heard, oh, well, it's because of the, for instances in the life of the mother that she might die or in rape or incest. But the life of the mother, rape and incest, those count for less than, I think it's less than a percent, less than 2% of all abortions that are performed in the United States. The rest of them are all performed in the name of convenience. I have so many friends who go to the murder mills across the country to stand outside to reach out to these mothers. And what you will find through photos that they've posted of people with signs and through video that you see is that many of these women come to these abortion clinics with full and complete understanding of what they're about to do. And not only do they walk into that abortion clinic with a full understanding that they're about to put to the end the life of their own baby, they do so laughing, giggling, celebrating all along the way. They are glorying in the things that they should be ashamed of. All across our country, there is sexual sin inside the LGBTQ movement that is celebrated. Things that the Bible says are detestable unto God. Our culture celebrates as good and right. Now that's outside, but let's move inside the church. It is astonishing to me that we have religious leaders, and I use that term loosely, and we have churches, and I use that term even more loosely, in our nation today that not only celebrate the pro-choice movement, not only celebrate the right of women to get an abortion, but promote and push for and, and lobby for the right of women to be able to kill their unborn children. That we have churches that celebrate the things that are happening in the LGBTQ movement, I saw a video just a week or two ago of a church that in the middle of the church service, as part of the church service, the pastor was up there with a man who was dressed like a woman in a full drag outfit, and they were up there and had all this stuff going on in the service. And and brothers and sisters, this is what Jesus is talking about when he says that a millstone should be put around their neck and dropped to the bottom of the sea. If someone would deceive small children in such a way, because they brought some kids up to the front of the room. And while that little child was up there, this pastor began to talk about that what we saw here in what was happening is what, is what Paul was talking about in Romans chapter 12, when he said, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. He said, being transformed by the renewing of your mind means that we learn new things and we become accepting of new things. And as we learn and understand these new things, then we change how we feel about them. And brothers and sisters, that is detestable. People who would do those kinds of things need to understand the danger that Paul is warning of here, that if they do not turn from those things, if they do not stop those things, they may think that they're being obedient to God. But in the end, destruction awaits them. In the end, their glory is their shame. And one day, all these things that they have gloried in, all these things that they have lifted up and celebrated— will be shameful to them as they stand before a just and a righteous and a holy God. And he exposes their sin. Now, let me be clear this morning. Neither abortion or sexual deviant sins are unforgivable sins. God can and will forgive anyone who comes to him in repentance and faith. If you're here this morning and you've had an abortion, God will forgive you of that. But what we're here talking about this morning is not those who have realized their sin and are broken over it, and desire to find forgiveness and grace in God. But we're talking about those who continue to live in outright rebellion against God. And not only that, to celebrate the evil that they are committing or promoting. And this is what was happening inside of this this community. Paul says that there are those who glory is their shame. All the wicked and evil things. And if you study church history, you study uh, secular history, you understand that even in the time in which Paul was writing these things, that inside the Roman Empire, sexual immorality was, was rampant. There were all kinds of evil and wicked sexual things happening. So Paul is not far removed from kind of where we are in our culture. 
So he clearly understands what's going on here, and he warns them of this danger, that their glory is in their shame. They celebrate in the things that they should be ashamed of. He goes on to say that they not only do that, but they set their mind on earthly things. They have a low view of life. Instead of looking up, they look down. Their entire life is focused on the things of this world. They have no concern for the spiritual matters because they're only concerned with themselves and what happens here on this earth. This world is their only hope and their only focus. But now thirdly, I want you to notice that Paul gives us clear instructions in verse 20 and 21 on how we should look differently than that. Look at what he says. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into the conformity with his body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. If I were to say the word home this morning, that word probably brings a stream of memories and emotions to you. You perhaps think of the home that you grew up in. You think about your parents and your siblings, the memories of gathering together for meals. You think about the joys and the laughter that you shared and maybe also some of the moments of tears and sorrow. Perhaps for some of you who are younger in the room, you think about the home that you have now. You've moved out of your parents and you're establishing your own home and beginning to set aside those memories for your children. There's a saying and it rings true. Be it ever so humble, there's no place like home. But here Paul points to the fact that our home is not here. Our home is not here upon this earth. As much as we love our earthly home and as much as we have joy and great sentimentality there, this place is not our home. Paul uses language here that would have been easily understood by the Philippians. As a colony of Rome, they looked like Rome in almost every regard. Even though they were far away from the Roman Empire, because they were a colony of Rome, almost everything about that city was unrecognizable or was was easily recognized by a Roman citizen. The dress, the architecture, the customs, the language, their governing structure. If someone were to fall asleep in Rome and be instantly transported to Philippi before they awoke, they would have found themselves in a very familiar place. Philippi, as many other colonies of Rome, were occupied by retired Roman soldiers. They had put in their duty. They had gained Roman citizenship. And so now they were placed in these different colonies around. And they considered themselves as citizens of Rome, even though they were not there. And they considered that with an utmost important and importance, and they lived it out with diligence and with full allegiance to the Roman Empire. So Paul is calling the Philippians to understand. He says, you consider yourselves as citizens of Rome. And you consider that to be a great thing, and you highly relish being a citizen of Rome. He says, but you need to understand now that you are not just a Roman citizen, but more importantly, he said, you are a citizen of heaven. And being a citizen of heaven requires you to live differently in your life than you were when you were just a citizen of Rome. They still lived in the same houses. They still lived in the same city. But now, because they're citizens of a different country, heaven is their homeland, and they act differently than they did before. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Paul would write to the church at Ephesus, so you are no longer strangers and aliens, but are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Beloved, we too are citizens of this heavenly country. Our home here is not our home. And this understanding changes everything about the way we live our life. The scripture tells us that we are in this world, but not of it. We have adopted the customs, the dress, the language, the attitudes, and the desires of our new heavenly home. Paul would write in Hebrews, but as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. We are thankful to live in the country in which we live here in America. We're thankful for the freedoms that we have. We're thankful for all that God has done. But brothers and sisters, let me tell you, America pales in comparison to the glory of that heavenly country. It is infinitesimal in the joy and the understanding of who we are in Christ. We're here for just a little while, but we're there with him for eternity. This country has nothing to offer us compared to what God has prepared and is awaiting for us. Paul was saying Galatians, but Jerusalem above is the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. Now we've all heard the saying of somebody to call somebody, they'd say, well, that's un-American. 
Somebody does something that seems to be counterintuitive to their American citizenship. They point that out. Well, that's an un-American thing to say or an un-American thing to do. But we should desire to live our lives in such a way that no one would be able to say to us that that's unheavenly, right? Because we're heaven's citizens. And we should desire to live our life in such a way that we exhibit that. There's an old saying, I've heard it repeated many a times, that somebody would point to another person and say, well, they're so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. And they use that as a, as a criticism. Now, let me be clear. There, there is a danger of becoming so focused on heaven that we forget what God has called us to do here. We still have a task to do. We still have a mission to accomplish. We still have a great commission to fulfill. But oh, we long for that day. We look for what God has done for us, and we know and understand that just as if you've been away for many, many months traveling somewhere, some of you in this room were in the military service, you know what it means to be away from home and then to finally be done and get to go home. And the joy when you walk back up on that front porch and you see your family again, oh, there's coming a day when our service here on this earth is going to be done and our Calling is going to be completed, and we're going to step out of this world and into that kingdom forevermore. And brothers and sisters, let us live our lives with that hope and that goal and that focus. Paul is pointing us here to understand our citizenship is in heaven, not in Rome, not in America, not in Haywood County. Our citizenship is in heaven. And he goes on, he says, for also which we eagerly await for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Eagerly wait means a a longing anticipation. We live our lives with this eager expectation of the second coming of Christ. And this should cause us to live our way in such a way that we pursue holiness and righteousness. Because we don't know when Jesus is coming back. We don't know when his second coming is going to occur. So we want to be living our lives in such a way that we are obedient to him, longing for him, waiting for him as if he would return in the next five seconds. Now, in a Roman colony such as Philippi, a visit of the emperor was a highly anticipated event. Historians point out that on occasions like this, that elaborate honors were were done. There were new coins that were struck, new highways were built, new buildings would be built, and, and public edifices would be put up, and all kinds of favors would be given out, would be given out to those in awaiting this coming of the emperor. They would give everything as citizens to pushing forward and waiting for the emperor to come visit. And as Christians, we should be doing the same in our own lives. As we understand that Jesus is coming soon, that he's coming back to take his church home, we should be living our lives in such a way that testifies to that fact. I want you to notice lastly in this passage here, he says not only are we waiting for the Savior, not only are we uh, confident of our citizenship in heaven, But notice what he says in verse 21. He says, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory. When that day happens, our lives are completely transformed. Paul says that our body here is in a humble state. It's translated lowly or vile in other versions. And it's not talking about the sinfulness of it, but just talking about how this body is in a humble way and that it's corrupted by sickness, disease, and sin. We can't live in this world in this body forever because death will take us. We can't live in this body and not suffer sickness or or ailments or pains. But brothers and sisters, one day our bodies will be made like his. No longer subject to the curse of sin, no longer riddled with disease, not subject to sickness, and never more to die. That scripture that was read earlier, for this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on the immortality. But when this perishable would have put on the imperishable, and this mortal would have put on the immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. When Christ returns, our lowly bodies will be instantly changed so that they will be identical and essential character to his. We're not given a divine body like Jesus because we are not divine, but we are given a body that is like his, that it is glorified. It is completely different than who we are now, but we are made like him. And how does this all happen? Paul points it out. He says that it happens by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Matthew Henry said, as Christ's resurrection was a glorious instance of the divine power, and therefore he is declared to be the son of God with power. 
By the resurrection of the dead, so will our resurrection be. And his resurrection is a standing evidence as well as a pattern of ours. And then all the enemies of the Redeemer's kingdom will be completely conquered. The same power that raised Jesus Christ up from the dead will raise us up into these new bodies and grant us everlasting life with him. If you believe that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, then you must believe and understand that you too will be raised up and given a new body that is like his to live forever with him. This is all done by God's power, all does by his authority, all done by the power that Jesus has within himself by the authority that God has given to him. Notice, I love the last part of that verse, that the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. What did Jesus say at the end of Matthew? All power and authority has been given to me in heaven and on the earth. Jesus is ruling and reigning now. He's ruling and reigning now in his heavenly kingdom at the right hand of God the Father. And by that same power, he will accomplish everything that he has promised that he will do. Brothers and sisters, let us look to Paul. Let us look to Timothy. Let us look to Epaphroditus. Let us look to the long list of those in church history. Let us look to those in our own life. Let us look to them as they look to Jesus. And let us live out our life in beautiful submission and obedience to him. Let us avoid those who live lives contrary to the gospel. Let us live outwardly as citizens of our true home. Let our lives demonstrate our allegiance to that heavenly kingdom. But let us rest in the power of Jesus. This life is impossible in our own strength. We can't accomplish anything in our own will and determination. But the power of Christ and his resurrection, the power that he has been given by God to rule and reign, will accomplish all these things in our life. There's an old song that I want to close with this morning. It says, There is coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. There'll be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no more pain, no more parting over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that shall be when my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. Let's pray together. Father, this morning, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. Lord, we thank you for the instruction that Paul has given us here. Lord, help us to live lives of obedience to you. Lord, help us to look to the example of Paul, to the example of those brothers and sisters in Christ around us, and to live as you desire and call for us to live. Lord, help us to set a good example for others around us. Lord, that they would see our lives and that they may emulate us as we emulate you. Father, help us to be mindful of false teaching. Help us to be mindful of those who would sneak in to deceive the church. Help us to be careful to know your word and to be mindful of what you have called us to do. And Father, help us to live as citizens of that kingdom. Lord, may we not be so caught up in the things here that we forget who we really are in you. Lord, we do long for that day. We long to see your face. We long to see all that you've prepared for us. But Father, we realize that we still have things to do here. Lord, that you have not returned because there's still work to do. And so Father, as long as there is still work to do, we pray, God, that you will help us to do it. Help us to be faithful. Help us to accomplish the things you've called for us to do. Father, while we continually look up and long and wait for that day you return. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name.